Yeah, so like what's the standard library? What kind of functions are provided? What else? How to do input and output. How to do input and output? Yeah, so it could be baked into the language. Like a language like Python print is a language statement. Right? Other languages like C, you have to import from standard library from standard io.h in order to get functions that will print for you. What else? How to construct a class or a function? Or yeah, how to construct a class, right? That would be one thing. How to construct new types, right? So you have the basic types. How do you construct more? How do you say, I want a point which is composed of two float values, an x and a y, right? And I want to consider that as one type. Or how do I create classes? Or how do I write functions, right? We just talked about which functions do what. But how do you even write your own functions? What else? Yeah. How to handle errors? How to handle errors, right? So different languages do it differently, right? Java throws exceptions. Um, C returns different values from a function depending on the error codes. What else? Anything else? We've exhausted everything? Imports. Imports, yeah, modules, right? How to use other people's code, whether it's a pound include in C or it's an import in Java. We want some way to be able to reuse other people's code. Okay, awesome. So we got a lot of different things. Uh, even variables, actually. We've been talking about this, right? How do we define variables? What does it mean to define a variable? When can I refer to that variable? And can I have variables of different names? What does that mean? Right? Functions. Creating functions. We just talked about. What about calling functions? Right? How to pass parameters to functions. Right? There's different ways maybe that we can do that. And what are the exact semantics of calling a function? As we'll see, they vary between programming languages and even between the same programming languages, you can have different semantics of passing arguments into a function. So function parameters, types, operators, exceptions, control structures. This is something that seems so basic we didn't even think about it. Right? So you have ifs, whiles, do whiles. Some languages like Lisp, you can actually create your own control structures. So you can create something called like an unless, which is like if but the opposite. So unless the condition is true, then do this, do the branch. So it's the opposite of an if. But it can actually make your code read a little bit easier. So like unless this variable is true, do this code block. Right? Rather than if this variable is not true, then do this code block. Yeah. So is it really only benefit of control structures and not regards just for readability? Sake, or is there some other things that would benefit from writing your own? Uh, oh, let's think. Is the benefit of having control structures? I'm making your own. You said oh, 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 making your own. Um, yeah, it all depends. You can, like with both link, with with most language features, you can go crazy and shoot yourself in the foot and do something insane that people read your code and is like, what in the world does this do? But if you use it correctly, you can do that in any language, right? But if you use it correctly, it can maybe help improve the readability and get across what you're trying to do. So it just depends. Yeah, like, so some languages have uh, for loops, like a C-style for loop for some initial condition, uh, uh, initial condition, and then a thing to do on every loop. Some languages have a for each loop. So you want to loop over every element of a collection. In a language where you can define your own control structures, you can create a for each loop. You don't need the language to have to support that and to change to enable that. Constants. Why do we want to use constants? Why don't we just use variables? I mean, we want things to stay the same guaranteed. Yeah, right? The compiler will guarantee that this variable does not change. I, when I was... Uh, in undergrad, I was working for a company who I will not name since we recorded. 
And I inherited some code that was written by, I think, a physics student who was like a self-taught programmer. And that person had wrote code that was like variable one equals one. Like variable O-N-E equals the value one. And then was using that. And I was just like, it hurt so bad because what if somebody changed that? What if later on it was one plus plus or something, right? If you're gonna take the time to declare a variable called one, you probably never want that thing to ever change. Right? So, anyway, so yeah, constants are super important language features, but even, so you can think about <laughs> constant variables, what about const in like C++, how does that help? It doesn't, you just ignore it. Unless the compiler yells at you and then you just put it in. Like just the constant? Like the const keyword on C++, like why would you want to use that on an argument to your function when you're defining a function? Yeah, or it knows, well, the key thing, just like with a constant variable, you're guaranteeing to the person who calls your function, I will not change this parameter, right? This value is going to remain constant. So you don't have to worry about passing in something and then having the function change it. That's one of the key benefits of doing that in C++. Cool. Methods. What's the difference between a method and a function? A method is a function in a class. Yeah, right? So a method, usually the way you think of it is a method is associated with a specific class, and when it's invoked, it operates on an instance of that class, that, and that instance is accessible usually to something, something like the this keyword or, or, or even parameter in the case of Python, right? Classes, all that kind of stuff, right? So we need definitions for every single one of these things, and can we have arbitrary, vague, oh yeah, just like add these things together, man. No, we need incredibly precise and accurate descriptions of what things do. And so, those of you that are very detail-oriented will have a very easy time of this section, because we're gonna be very precise in how we define the semantics of the language operators that we use. And we will look at different types of semantics for different types of things and how that changes our programs. So this is, you really have to focus on these things and be very precise. And of course, as I say this, now I'm worried that I'm going to mess up when I go to examples. So let's say I'm doing that on purpose, and your job is to check me as I say things to make sure I'm saying them very precisely. Cool. Let's think of something super simple, like declarations. So what is a declaration? Yeah, so defining usually, and now we'll kind of think about C for right now. Uh, it applies to other languages. So we want to define variables. What other things do we want to declare or define? I mean, you want to declare scope? Scope? Do you actually explicitly declare that? Functions. Functions, you may want to declare. So in C, you can declare a function without defining it and say, here's my function signature. I'm going to use this. I'm going to define it later. Trust me. Right? So we'll see that scope and declarations are very intertwined. So sometimes we need to, in our language contracts, just depending on the language itself, we need to explicitly say, I want a variable called I. And I want a variable called foo. I'm running out of names, so I'm not going to do it anymore. But um, oftentimes, we want to give these definitions names, right? We want to declare, I have a variable. I want to call it foo so I can reference it later. And I want to, uh, it has a specific type, right? That'd be what you're declaring. Does every declaration have or need a type? I'm right, sorry, name? Type works too. Let's go with type first. Does every declaration need a type? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So you have an implicit type. Yeah. So it, once again, it depends on the language, and it depends on the semantics of that language, right? C and and Java, you pretty much need to declare types 100% of the time. But in a language like Python, you don't need to declare types at all. And in some languages, you can even 
types are optional. So you cannot declare them, but if you do, the compiler will use that information to generate optimized code for that specific type. What about names? Are names mandatory? Yes. Yes? What was that? You may need to use it somewhere. If you're assigning it, then yeah, what if I assign it to something? Let's think about this, because we're going to come back to this. I'm trying to think of if you've experienced this. I would say you probably haven't seen it yet, but you can create anonymous types, types with no name. You can create a struct that has no name. You can define a variable, and its type is a structure with no name. We'll get to the uses of that, but names are even optional, right? So you want to think about the design space here. We're talking about these kind of things because we're talking about the design space of programming languages. So I want you to think about crazy stuff like that. Like, what if I had a language with no names? <laughs> It'd be weird. You could do it. Actually, you definitely can. Well, we, wow, I don't think I'll remember, but maybe bring this up when we talk about lambda calculus. We have no names there and we do cool stuff. Well, what kind of things? Yeah, anyways. anyways. Um, right? What about languages with no names? What about languages with no types? What about languages with no names and types? Right? You want to think of that design space and then think, how does that affect me, the programmer, when I write programs in this language? So, super simple declaration, right? In I, I have an integer I. But in some languages, declarations are implicit. So in Python, you don't actually have to declare a variable. You actually, I don't even think you, can you? I mean, I guess you can just put it there, but. So like we said with implicit variable declarations, right? So here, I have target equals the test value plus 10. So this is saying, I want, a new I want a new variable target if it doesn't already exist. So why might that be good or bad? Yeah, so like, so, so A, there's a thing of not having to specify types, right, which is kind of cool. So I don't need to specify types. That declutters things. B, I don't have that lines at the top of my function, right, that specifies exactly everything I'm going to do, right? It would be like kind of like reading a book. At the beginning of the book, or at the beginning of the chapter, you have a list of all the characters who are going to appear in this book or in this chapter, right, just to get you ready for reading. You would skip over that because you'll see it, you'll kind of figure it out. What are some of the downsides? I think it's still, and it will still work. Yeah, that's the big one, right? So if you mistype it, let's say you already declared target above, and then here, or even worse, let's say above I use targets, and now here I'm using target without an S. The compiler, the compiler doesn't complain. It sees a new variable. It creates a new variable for you, and, but your code doesn't work, and your code doesn't crash. The worst part, it just doesn't work right. right. So that's actually a huge problem when you're using these dynamic programming languages where you don't have to explicitly declare things. Cool. Well, let's talk about names. I already said you can do stuff without names, but let's talk about names. So, one of the key questions that we're going to be looking at now is once a variable, once something is declared, how long is that declaration valid? Only for that scope that's declared inside. But what is scope? Well, it's like the function. What is it? What could it be? Function? So variables you define that function are accessible in that function? Class. The, the class. So you declare, if you declare a member variable of a class, it's accessible throughout any function in that class. Only in its parameters, I guess. What was that? Is it only in its parameters, so it would like say something inside uh, like a for loop mm -hmm. and then it won't work anymore outside it's like for a counter cap inside your for loop. Yeah, so how does that work? Because if C, so what's C? Is it a function? If you define a variable inside of let's say an if block, can you access that variable outside that if block? No. 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 So C actually has block level scoping. It's all about the parentheses, or the, not parentheses, what are they? Curly braces. 
Yeah. Right? Whereas other languages like JavaScript, variables are declared at the function level. So a variable declared anywhere in a function, it's accessible anywhere in that function until the end of the function. What are some other types? So we talked about member variables, which are uh, accessible all the way throughout the class, or any method associated with that class. What else? Globals. Globals. So how, where are those accessible by? Everywhere. Everything. Everywhere. Can I access your global variables? In a program. In whose program? <laughs> In the file. Not the file school. Maybe there actually is file scope. So if you look, um, if you look at the lexer.c from project two, a lot of the variables, some of the variables are declared static, and that means they're only accessible in that file. So even if you include lexer.h, you can't access any of those values, even though they're global variables. So that's what static keyword means on variable declarations in C code. It's file. Well, let's say I don't have static. And think back to project two. How'd you get the line numbers from project two? Did it manually by hand? It's all in the process. It's all in whose process? The running process. The where did where did the line number live? Lexer.c. Yeah, in Lexer.c, but you're writing your code. What is it? Project two dot c? Did we tell you what to call it? Something else dot c? And it's including that, but it's actually not, it's not including the header file. The header file is only declarations, which says, hey, there will be an integer called line numbers. Don't worry about it. And then it compiles, you compile both, and then the linking steps links that together and says, hey, your program.c is actually relying on a line number variable. Oh no, great, that's defined in this .o file. That's what the .o files are. And so then it links it together before it spits out the binary. So that's how you access global variables. So me, at my computer here, I can't access your global variables, right? But could I? Could you write a language? Could you think of a language? What would it mean to have a language where let's say function definitions are global? Like actually global. Would it be cool or terrible? Yeah. Yeah, so you need some way of distinguishing between different instances of the same name. Why would it would be useful? No. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if you could just like call my a function that I wrote just by saying like, oh, hey, call this function, and you know it's my function. I wrote it. It's out there. Let's say on the web. You can just reuse my code, right? That code reuse becomes incredibly easy. It's actually even better if then you have a way to uniquely identify a specific instance of a function. And every instance is unique. So I could refer to that specific version of your function. And I know you're not going to change it. So yeah, so we've seen some declarations are accessible the entire program, some just the entire file, some could be global. And actually, if you think that's super crazy, things like Android package names, and they do Android app development, you have to create, you have to give every package a name, and that name has to be unique across every single Android application in the Google Marketplace. So I actually get around that problem, right? They have the same problem, but they manage, right? There's, I think there's like two million Android apps now or something crazy, right? But they're able to do it, right? So yeah, they do things like this, like the Facebook app is usually just like Java package names is where they came from. You reverse the domain name, do like com.facebook.katana. Some things are functional. And so the related question of here, right, and these are two sides of the same coin, right? One question is how long is a name valid, right, which is what we've been talking about. If you declare something in C, in a block, it's accessible throughout that block. The reverse question is, when you see the use of a variable, if you see foo, how do you map foo to a declaration? How do you know that foo is an integer, or is it a string, or what is it? Right? This is, these are the same, pretty much the same question, right? 
So scope is what we're going to be studying here. Scope is the semantics behind this question, behind how long is a declaration valid and how to actually resolve a name. And so we'll see there's different styles of doing this, and these mean different things for your program. And you have any thoughts on names? It seems like something super simple and trivial, right? But was it obvious to you when you first learned it? That like, did you? So we actually, so there's a resounding no when I asked if you a variable to find an if block in C is accessible outside. Is that because you've been burned by that? Or you tried to do that and then the compiler complained? He didn't really know why, so he just like moved it somewhere else. Yeah, so, right? These things aren't obvious necessarily, but they need to be taught. And they're completely up to the control of the language designer. That's the key piece. You have a lot of variety and a lot of different ways you can do this. So cool. Let's think about C style scoping. So C uses block level scoping, like we said. So the declarations are valid in the block that they're declared. Right? And then we have this caveat about global, right? So declarations that are not in the block are global unless the static keyword is used, in which case the declaration is only for that file. Boom. That's all you need to know. Done. Should we go home? Not yet. Okay. JavaScript is different. Declarations are valid in the function. That's why um, Anybody do a lot of JavaScript programming? Yeah, so you have the problem that when you have a script block and you want to declare a variable inside that script block but not have that variable leak and be global, you have to surround that inside an anonymous function and then immediately call that function. And so that's why doing a variable declaration in JavaScript, if you don't want that declaration to be global, you have to create an anonymous function because that declaration needs to be only in that function. Cool. Okay, let's look at some C code. I love looking at code. Alright, so we're going to include standard IO.h. What's in there? What is it? Input output. Yeah, input output stuff, printf is in there. What was that? Scanf. Scanf, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, scanf, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the C function. I was thinking about what's what's the C plus plus one? Oh, that's the C and C. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we're declaring a function name. Is this valid C? Should I add more arguments here? Yeah. Well, so, okay. We'll think if that's true later. We haven't revealed all the code yet. Right? But most main, main can take in up to three parameters. The first parameter is argc, the number of arguments that are passed. The second one is a character pointer pointer, argv, a vector of character pointers of the string arguments that are passed in. And the third one is an environment pointer. Um, it's usually called the MVP, which is a pointer to a bunch of environment variables. So we can define all that, we can also define nothing, and it will still work. Cool. So let's say inside here I have a block, I have int i, I say i is equal to 10,000, and I print out the value of i. Valid C? Yep. You can do it as much as you want. Yep. Block, block, block blocks. Always, the only thing it cares about is blocks. And then I can make another block, and I can say print out I. Is this valid C? No. Yeah, no. So let's think about it. Is it syntactically valid C? Did I forget a semicolon anywhere? Look at it in your head. Is it going to compile? Yes. Yeah. You're just saying that it's on the screen. I should do that. I should put random bugs into these things so we can practice. Right? So syntactically, it should be a valid C file. Right? Our include is correct. The int main is correct. We have matching blocks here. Is that invalid syntax? syntax? I mean, that should go check an entire one block and then I use the block. Talking about syntax. Is the syntax valid? Yes. Yes, it should. Yeah? So what would make it invalid syntax? Yeah. Getting a notation mark? Yeah. 
I forget, if I miss this quotation mark, then it's going to be an invalid syntax. Right, so I have a quotation. Although, can quotations do new lines? No, I, think I don't think so. I don't think so, right? Yeah, I don't think you can do multi line in C uh, strings. So, yeah, that would definitely be an error. If I forgot a semicolon anywhere, well, anywhere that there is a semicolon, these three places, right, that would be an error. If I forgot any one of these braces, that would be an error. If I any of the braces, if I didn't have these parentheses, that would also be a syntax error. Right? So it's important to think about what is it valid syntactically is, does it look like it could be a valid C program? And the semantics question is, is this semantically a valid C program? No, why not? And if yes, why? The I in the second block there is just no but is it's not the same scope of where it was declared. Right, so where, so we have a declaration, so how many declarations do we have here? One. Two. Where's the first one? Main. Main. We actually technically probably have a lot more because include standard IO is going to .h, is going to paste that header file of standard IO .h there, and that's going to have a ton of declarations for all the printf functions that we want. But we don't have to worry about that. It's just in this code, Right? We're declaring here a function called main that has what? <coughs> what's the return type of main? An int. And then what's the parameter type of main? Void. It doesn't take anything. It takes in nothing. Right? No, no arguments here. Cool. So that's the first declaration. And that means that, well, we didn't talk about how things are declared here. But then later on in another function, I could call main. Right? There's nothing special about main. Main just says this is where to start, but I could call this function again. And I guess we should say main is valid inside its own body. Right? So I could have main call main recursively. If I was a crazy person, maybe I am. So in my second definition, I have an int i here. So I'm declaring a variable i. And so now on this line, what's going to happen? Assignment. It's going to assign the value 10,000 where? To i. To i. Which i? The one is the scope. This declaration of i. So we always want to think, so we want to map the usage to the declaration. Right here, i is being used. I want to map it here. Good. And where is this i mapped to? Yeah, the same one, right? And so we think about the block level scoping means that i is declared here. It's accessible anywhere in that block. And so when we see this i here, what do we map it to? The one that should have been declared in that block. But it's missing. Yeah, can we map it to any declaration? Is it main? No, that's the only other thing. Is it defined in standard io.h? Probably not, that'd be weird. <coughs> okay, let's compile it. So we can try compiling it, and it's gonna say, in function main, I undeclared, right? At line 11, which show plays this one right here. And so the reason is exactly what we talked about, right? This I has this scope. It is defined in this block. And so all usages of I first look up in their local scope, their local block, Hey, is a, did, was there something declared that's called i? If there's not, then it looks in the scope above that, in the global scope. Or if there's any other scopes, it'll keep looking until it gets to the global scope, and finally it says, no, there's no variables defined here. Cool, i and i. So this i has nowhere to go, so it's an error, right? Cool, now you know where your errors come from. Put an if around here, it's the exact same thing, right? Get rid of these braces, and it's still the same thing. Right? Because this i is only accessible in this scope, and so this is outside here. What if I got rid of these braces? Would it work or would it not work? Which braces? These braces. It would not work. It would work? What are we saying? Is going to work? Is not going to work? 
Well, I'm not gonna, I was gonna do an example, but we'll, it would work, right? So this I, without these, without this block, this I is declared for this whole scope of main. And so this, it would be a sub, a child scope of main scope. And so it would still, this I would look first locally in its local scope and say, is there an I here? No, let's check the outer one, which is main. It would say, yes, there is a declaration of I here. And so we know that that's the one we've used. Cool. So now I made one line change. Was it syntactically valid? Is it semantically valid? No? It's not initialized yet. Is that invalid semantics, though? So let's think of it. I guess we need to break that question down a little bit. Does this usage of I here map to a specific declaration of I? Yes. 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 So in that case, that's semantically fine. Some people also notice some other problems. There's no return of main. Can you still compile a C program without a return value? Yes. Yeah, it's actually just a warning. So that's actually technically not against valid, semantically valid C. It's not good C code. You can do it. The same goes for here. You're basically using a variable before you've assigned it a value, right? And so this is actually fine behavior. I mean, it's not fine. You can do this, but you get, um, the compiler makes no guarantee on what it's gonna output, right? So I can compile this, I can run it, it's gonna put 10,000 and it's gonna put something else. And so this was on, so just to tell you, uh, this was on a CentOS 6.7 system that I compiled this and ran this. This is on the Mac, so it's actually using a different, uh, it's not using GCC, it's using Clang to compile everything. When I run it, I get a completely different answer. Right, why? Is that the memory address? It's not, it's not the memory address of the I. The memory address of the I, I, as we'll see, is on the stack somewhere. That could be one theory, yeah, that's a good theory, right? So one, one could be maybe the compiler automatically initializes it to zero. I would say that may be unlikely because compilers want to be very fast, and so if they have to initialize every variable that you didn't initialize, I don't know, they may be doing more work because you may initialize it later and now they've done this uh, unnecessary work. But they definitely, they could do that, right? Um, Really what it's doing is just outputting whatever is at this memory location, whatever was there before. In this case, on Linux for whatever reason, it's zero, and here in, on Mac, it's some other value, which, so. Okay, so now we need to look at, so now we look at some examples of different type, I mean different ways in which our intuition and our understanding of C Right? It seems all silly to be talking at this level of detail about these very basic things, but we really want to understand how this is done. And so we're going to focus on how to resolve a name. So when we want to resolve a name, right, as we saw, we want to map that name back to the place that it was declared. Why do we want to do this? Yeah, the declaration has the, has the information about the type, right? So you want to make sure that in that scope, all instances of that variable are of the same data type. You wouldn't want to, in some cases, think it's an int and then later assume it's a string, right? You're going to have problems. Why else? So you know where to find the value of it? Yeah, you know where to find the value of it, right? It's, it's one thing to think about, like, abstractly, these are variables, right? And variables have types, and variables have values as the program is executing, right? What is a variable to the computer? 
like to the CPU. Yeah, it's just a chunk of memory somewhere on the computer, right? And it's going to be the size of that is going to be the size of the data type, and that's going to be system dependent. On a 32-bit system, this integer will be 32 bits, right? And so, but it's just 32 bits somewhere in memory. So the computer needs to know, hey, here, when I set that memory to the equivalent of 10,000 for an integer, when I print that out, I better print out that same memory address, and I better not print out something else, right? Because all the CPU, all this, the, the hardware knows about is registers and memory. That's it. But us, we don't want to think about registers and memory. We want to think about variables, right? So the compiler's job is to do this mapping, mapping variables and variable usage to memory addresses. And we're going to get into that much later. Is it much later? OK. So to do this, we're going to use a data structure we're going to call a symbol table. So the symbol table is going to store in every scope what declarations are there in that scope and any metadata associated with that declaration. Is it an integer? Is it a function? Uh, what's the data type? All those specific things that we need. And so the symbol is basically mapping declarations to attributes. And so we're going to look at two different ways. So remember I talked about design decisions, right? We're going to study different ways of how to do this mapping. It may seem like there should only ever be one way because that's the only way you've ever learned or used in your programming languages. Right? But the point is that those are just arbitrary decisions that we've made as a community. And they have pros and cons as opposed to other ways of doing this scoping and this resolution. But fundamentally, we still need to do the same thing. We see a name, how do we map that to a declaration? So static scoping, it's in the name. It's done statically. What does that mean? In that file, in that instance, should it ever change based on how the program executes? Yes. It should change. <coughs> so on different runs of this program, I will point to different values. No. No? So that's what we mean by statically. We mean that when we compile the program, we do this mapping then. We do it once, and that's it. It's done. It never changes, no matter how that program is executed. Every time that I is seen, it's the same memory address as this other I over here. The flip side of that is you think, OK, well, one is static. The other one's going to be dynamic, right? So we're actually doing this resolution of names to declarations dynamically as the program executes. So we're looking up in the symbol, we're building the symbol table dynamically as the program executes, and we're going to look up and find and map usages to declaration, to values in the symbol table at runtime. And this means that different paths to the program, different executions, can mean that different usages of variables are mapped to different declarations. And so we'll see, there's pros and cons to each approach, but we need to study them, understand them, to talk about them, to really uh, to be able to talk about that. Cool. So those are key differences. All right, let's look at an example. So this is going to be static scoping, so this is the stuff that you're familiar with, right? This is your, your stuff, right? So we have an int x, so what's going to be the scope of this x? What was that? Global, yeah. It's a bit of a lie, though. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So, what do I have here? A function. What's the name of the function? Bar. Bar. We have a function bar. It returns nothing, and it accepts no parameters. Right? Cool. Now I have a function foo. Is this a declaration? Yes. 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 
That's important, right? It's a declaration. It's also, you can say with a function, it's also a definition of the function, right? So you can think about what's the big difference in information between var and foo here? The parameters, foo has parameters. I mean, foo tells you it takes in no parameters, and the declaration of var tells you it takes in no parameters. What was that? Yeah, there's no body, right? We don't know what's actually the code of var. I don't know, right? But here we know the code, we know the body of foo, right? That's just the big difference between definitions and declarations. Cool. And here I can do things like this. I can say I have a character C, and I'm setting it to the character C. Declaration. Yeah, is this going to be, is C going to be accessible from bar's definition? No. No, block level, right? It's only defined in this block. Right. Now can I call bar? Yes. Yes, yes. yes why? It's yeah, I can call bar because it's already been declared, right? As we'll see, we're just stepping through this now, but we'll see, we'll go through build the symbol table and see how we resolve these. And I can print out x as an integer and c as a character. Can I do these things? Yeah. What does this x refer to? X x. Yeah, the global x. Awesome. So I have baz here. What's the scope of baz? Yeah, just baz and globals. What was that? Say that again? It just what's inside baz. baz and Not what's inside, baz itself. And global. It's a global. Right? But this is why that's a misnomer. Can I call can I call Baz from foo? No. No. No, doesn't sound very global, does it? Right? So it's really the strict, super strict definition is from the declaration to the end of the file, and any files that include this can call it for global. Right? So from here to the end of the file, anybody can call X. This is why, if you're coding like a single file C program, it's good to have your definitions, your declarations of your functions on the top, so that any function can call those. Right? Otherwise, you have to properly structure your functions such that you never call a function you haven't defined yet. And this is why header files are so important, because it's the same idea. You take those definitions, or those declarations, you move them to a separate file, and you include them at the top, and they include just paste them right in there. But now you're actually declaring all the functions you're going to use, and they're going to be available to any function in that C, in that C code. Now it's like two minutes. Sweet. OK, we have Baz. Baz prints out x. And then it sets x to 1,337. Which x is this? Global. Global x. Perfect. OK, now we have function bar, which now is the new declaration. Yeah, it's creating a new variable x in which scope? In bar's local block scope. Exactly, cool. Then it can call baz. So what if I access x here? Which x would get access? Would it be this one? Or would it be this one? The local one, yeah. The question is why? We'll see why in a second. Do the algorithm for how you look up and map the usage to a declaration. Now we finally get to our main function, where we set x to 10. Which x is this? Global. Global. Then inside another scope, we set declare a new x, where x is now not an integer; it's a character pointer. Or it's a yeah pointer to a character, and we print out the string x. So this usage, which x is this going to refer to? The global in x? No, it's going to be a character point. Well, we'll see. And then it's going to call foo. But won't this be an error? Why? Why do they create for x? Yes. So the question is, are there different, different declarations of x? 
And the other way to think about this is there anywhere you can write an X in this program that maps to two of the same declarations? On that note, let's think about that. That's the only thing I want you to do this weekend is the plot. No, that's not true. <laughs> Study for midterm, do project three, and also think about this. <laughs>